Dave and Jamie, thank you so much for being here to share your story. I appreciate it. Glad to do it. Pleasure of course. to be here, Dave. So, Jamie, I want to start with you. We're talking about both of your experiences on 9-11. Both of you were in the city, not with your current outlets, but covering 9-11 in some capacity. Jamie, you were on the ground. Tell me what you were doing when 9-11 happened. I understand that you didn't start the day wanting or expecting to cover 9-11, rather. I don't think any of us did, right? I uh, was on my way to ABC News, where I worked as a correspondent. I actually remember thinking what a beautiful day this is. And then, of course, 9-11 happened. The towers were hit, and I raced uh, into the newsroom and was dispatched immediately to what we then came to know as Ground Zero. Did you know right then and there that it was a terrorist attack? Did you know that at the time, or did you find out later after you went into the field? No, 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 no. Of course, we're all looking back with hindsight, 20 years of hindsight and, you know, recovered memories are, are fallible. But uh, my recollection is that initially we did not know what was happening. You know, we started thinking about previous events that might inform our understanding, you know, helicopters that had flown into buildings and could this be an accident? And But, but pretty quickly we began to realize that this was some sort of attack. Uh, and as journalists, we knew, don't jump to conclusions, certainly don't jump to them on the air, but even in your mind, reserve your judgment. Uh, even as we started to think this must have been some sort of attack, we didn't jump to terrorist attack right away. Uh, certainly for myself, uh, as, a, as a trained attorney also, uh, jumping to conclusions is the worst thing you can do. So it was quite some time before we came to that conclusion. And, and we wanted to rely on the facts uh, and the authorities uh, before we started to report that this was indeed a terrorist attack. And, and that second plane, and then certainly the Pentagon in Pennsylvania and everything that happened thereafter started to inform our very tragic conclusions and terrifying conclusions, terrifying terror about what was happening. So I want to come back to that, but Dave, I want to go to you. You were in a newsroom at the time in New York City. Describe the confusion for me. Obviously, we cover breaking news all the time as journalists, but this was a once-in-a-lifetime event, and I have to imagine in the newsroom there was a flurry of confusion. Nobody knew what was going on. Well, uh, let me correct you, Dan. I was in Washington, D.C., near the Pentagon. Right. I was an overnight news producer on, of all things, a business program. So I had just worked the overnight. Um, and oddly enough, uh, at, at the end of my shift, I wanted to play tourist. It was actually on my agenda that morning to go to the Pentagon. Um, wow. And, I, and my family was still up in Buffalo, and I had told them that, uh, but I was just too tired at the end of the shift, so I went home and, and took a quick nap. Um, I initially learned about the Twin Towers when my family called and said, were you at the Pentagon? Because that was my previously stated agenda. And I said no, and they said, get out of bed, turn on the TV. And as soon as I saw that, by that point, we had started to hear what Jamie was talking about, the idea that this was terrorism. And immediately, I just uh, went right back to the newsroom. Um, even though my actual shift was the overnight, everybody, just all hands on deck, were in that newsroom for the balance of that day. How close were you to the Pentagon in the newsroom there? I'm not familiar with the station that you were at. I don't know the location, but how close were you to the Pentagon, and how did that influence your coverage there? We, we were at uh, inside a building on K Street about three blocks from the White House, so we were pretty much white, right downtown, uh, Pentagon being obviously out toward Arlington Way. Um, but one of the things, one of the most visceral memories I have um, was everywhere you went, even outside our studios, I lived in a suburban area on the other side of uh, Maryland. Everywhere you went, the subways smelled like burnt rubber because once the plane hit the Pentagon and the Pentagon is connected to the subways, it was everywhere. You could not do anything with public transit in D.C. and not feel this event. Even if you weren't like, like Jamie, actually on the scene enveloped by the clouds, it was just this constant presence of the smell of fire and burnt rubber. Jamie, describe to me how you were feeling as you went towards the Twin Towers. As I read in a, a, a transcript that you forwarded to me, you didn't shy back away from the scene there. You actually went with your crew towards the Twin Towers 
through the smoke. What were you feeling? How did you do that? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's true what Dave says, that smell, now, now that he brings it up, that was with us for days and weeks and not just in what we called the zone at the time. The zone was the area around the, the uh, disaster of the Twin Towers. But yes, we moved toward uh, what we then would learn was an attack. We didn't even know what was happening, right, Dan? We didn't know what was happening, but we did know that people were rushing in the other direction, uh, warning us off, telling us, turn around, <laughs> turn around. Some were running, many were walking oddly, walking, um, you know, in a, a sort of dazed state. Um, so yes, we were moving toward it. The ash is falling through the air uh, and, and other things falling through the air. I mean, I, I can, I can uh, it, it does really come back to you as you begin to relive it. Um, and people covered, as you remember those images uh, in the ash and soot, uh, uh, they're, they're all the same color, whatever their uh, natural skin tone, suddenly everybody is the same covered in this um, ashy debris, uh, their hair, their faces, uh, and we were all inhaling it. Think about that. And the first right. responders now continue to die from having uh, made their way through what we call the pile. Uh, the, the the remains of the two towers for weeks trying to recover uh, those who, who died. Uh, they continue to this day, just a week ago, another police officer died of 9-11 related injuries. So the, 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 the debris from those towers so deadly, as was obviously the impact itself. Dave, I want to turn to you and Jamie, I'll pose the same question to you right after. I feel like on 9-11 in the days immediately after, there were a lot of emotions floating around, one of them being fear. Nobody knew what was going on or what was going to happen next. The next is sadness. Uh, there was a tremendous loss of life, both in D.C. and in New York City. Dave, how did you balance covering this with all that fear and sadness versus your responsibility to get information to people that they needed? I, I think it was a matter of just isolating myself, being in the newsroom and focusing on what I had to do. Um, I have in the past covered plane crashes where it was the same thing. And then three days later, it suddenly hit me and, and the sadness came in. I think you just take, you, you've got to compartmentalize it. Um, you've, there, there was certainly a lot of fear in and around Washington afterwards because right after this came the anthrax, uh, anthrax attacks. And then there was that Washington DC sniper and they were all within about three weeks of each other. Um, again, it was a very scary real sort of thing the newsroom was almost peaceful because there i was able to compartmentalize it but out in the streets and in the community you could you could sense that fear that you're talking about dan jamie same question to you i mean how did you do this i as somebody who covered the pandemic in just the past year i found it difficult to uh, to balance the sadness and the need to get information out to people. How did you do that, especially on the ground? I imagine as a reporter in a once in a lifetime event, it was terrifying. Right, well, um, I, I think my training as an attorney, first and foremost, really did train me to, as Dave uses the very appropriate word, compartmentalize, to separate out your own feelings, emotions, responses from what the work is, the, the facts that you need to get across to help people get through a crisis. That's our role as journalists, right? To provide information at a critical time, the most critical time. But I, I have to say, I'm glad you brought up the pandemic because a lot of young people have asked me about our national response to 9-11 in unity uh, and cooperation and collaboration. Uh, as opposed to how we've responded as a nation during the pandemic. And, and I think for journalists, it's very, very traumatic. We go through these events, we compartmentalize, but do we ever really recover? Or are we just living in a constant state of PTSD? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I worry that all my compartmentalism may be um, in, it's taking its toll and I'm not aware of it, but I think the work we do is very, very important. We do a service to the nation and, and I hope that journalists continue to do that work uh, because there will always be these challenges for us and, and our, our role is an important one in a democracy. 
I hope so too. In some senses, especially in these major events, we are also a sort of first responder to these events to get people the information that they may want or need. And sometimes it can put us in situations that are not safe, that other people may not go into. But, you know, we'll leave it there. We could talk about this all day, but uh, we will leave it there. Jamie Floyd from WNYC, Dave Debo from WBFO. Thank you both so much for sharing your stories. Thank you for having us, Dan.